This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. You can also see most of our lectures at our, on our website, which is at vsh.org. Okay, it's now time for our special guest. We're so happy to have with us tonight our friend, Dr. John Westerdahl. He is currently the director of the Bragg Health Foundation and the director of health science for Bragg Live Food Products. He's an internationally recognized authority in the field of nutrition and wellness. He's a nutritionist, a registered dietitian, a certified nutrition specialist, a master herbalist. He's a board certified anti-aging practitioner and health educator. A graduate of Loma Linda University School of Public Health, his Bachelor of Science, Master of Public Health, and Doctorate degrees are in the fields of food, nutrition, and health education. Previously, he served as Director of Wellness and Lifestyle Medicine at Castle Medical Center in Kailua. Tonight, he will discuss the power of plant foods in anti-aging and lifestyle medicine. Please welcome Dr. John Westerdahl. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And aloha. Boy, uh, it's been almost three years since I was last here in Hawaii. Many of you know that I served as Director of Wellness and Lifestyle Medicine at Castle Medical Center, doing many vegetarian health programs, and it's wonderful to be back. Today, I work for Dr. Patricia Bragg. How many of you use Bragg Liquid Aminos? By the way, Patricia just called me a couple hours ago, and she wanted to say aloha to all of you and send, you, send her aloha and peace and love and greetings to you to de- tonight. She's in Chicago uh, speaking this week uh, while I'm over here in Hawaii. <laughs> so anyway, it's a privilege to be here tonight. And tonight I'm going to be talking about the power of plant foods in anti-aging and lifestyle medicine. And there's two key points in this lecture I want you to remember. Actually, this summarizes the whole thing. The first one is, food from plants prevent the diseases that are killing us. Fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans. The second important principle of tonight's talk is that foods from plants promote health, longevity, beauty, and vitality. Those are the key two principles I'd like to talk about this evening. Plant foods, I believe, are the most important thing in helping to prevent diseases, treat diseases, and even reverse diseases, and eating a vegetarian and ideally a vegan diet. You are what you eat. You've heard that? What you eat today, this is a Paul Bragg statement, what you eat today is walking and talking tomorrow. Think about that. It becomes a part of you. You know, live foods produce what? Live bodies, healthy bodies. Dead food, which unfortunately most Americans eat a diet primarily of what I call dead food, you know, the devitalized, the refined foods. Of course, if you eat meat, you're eating a dead animal, right? Dead foods produce what? Illness, sickness, disease leading to death. We want to focus on what we call a live food diet based on plant foods, focused on fruits and vegetables and grains and legumes and these types of things. Well, the healthcare of the 21st century, what is the future of that? There's a lot of questions. Obama, this past week, has been working on, you know, trying to figure out ways on reducing healthcare costs and insurance. And we are in a major crisis today in the healthcare system. Not just from a financial standpoint, but also from a health standpoint. You know, we rank, rank about number 18 in, as far as health is concerned in the whole world. 
And today we have seven-year-old children who have adult onset diabetes. We have young kids who have adult types of diseases. Not too long ago, a nurse, in fact, the Catholic Medical Center, told me that her son, who's 13 years old, his arteries are all blocked up, according to his doctor. 13 years of age. And why is that? Because most of his life, he ate at McDonald's. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, most of his meals are made up of the foods from McDonald's, the fast foods. So it's really child abuse, I believe, in the way many parents feed their kids today. They're putting them on a diet program that's going to lead to premature disease, illness, disease, and death. And the other thing is I want to mention is that I remember not too long ago, just a few years ago, at the American Dietetic Association Convention, the Surgeon General of the United States said, if we continue in the way we're going today, as far as the way kids are eating, that in this generation, parents will outlive their own children if we continue in the current way we're headed. Well, you know, at Castle Medical Center, part of my job was to keep people out of the hospital, show them a better way of life. And this is a picture of Castle, and they still have a wonderful wellness and lifestyle medicine program going. I was there today visiting with the staff, and it's amazing some of the great things that they're doing. And I encourage you to look on the website, find out some about the health classes and vegetarian cooking classes that they have at Castle all the time. But at Castle Medical Center, and this is typical of hospitals all over the country, is that 70% of the patients are there because of diet and lifestyle-related reasons. Think of that. Diet and lifestyle-related reasons. If people ate right, they didn't smoke, they did exercise, they followed a healthy lifestyle, chances are 70% of those patients would not be in the hospital. Here we have the ultimate causes of death. This is the World Report. This is a few years ago, but it shows that tobacco, blood pressure, alcohol, cholesterol, overweight, low fruit and vegetable intake, these are amongst the leading ultimate causes of death, and it breaks it down as far as what types of diseases, as you can see on the chart with the different color schemes there as, as far as which is cardiovascular disease and cancers and, and so forth and nutritional deficiencies. Here we have the causes of death in the United States. Heart disease, of course, is the number one killer, yet most of heart disease, in many cases, can be prevented. Then we have cancer, stroke, lung disease, and accidents and diabetes. But most of the diseases that you see here are things that we can do something about. Tobacco smoking is the ones marked in black is related to that disease. Poor diet and inactivity, which we're going to be talking a, a little bit about tonight. And then alcohol, all our factors in these different uh, causes of death in our country. Well, a number of years ago, Senator Tom Harkin, senator from Iowa, wrote a very important article that appeared in the American Journal of Health. He was talking about health care, not sick care. You know, we don't really have health care. If we had health care, everyone would be healthy, right? We really have sick care. And he pointed out in this article that few would argue with the statement that if, we, if you get sick, the best place in the world to get care that you need is here in America. We have the best trained, highest skilled health professionals in the world. We have cutting edge, state of the art equipment and technology. We have world class health care facilities and research institutions, no question about that. But when it comes to helping people stay healthy and stay out of the hospital, we fall woefully short. In the United States, we spend approximately $1.8 trillion a year on health care, and that's gone up since this article was written. Fully 75% of, of that total is accounted for by chronic diseases, things like heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, all of which, in a large measure, are preventable. Meanwhile, only 2% of all health care spending is on prevention. What is wrong with this picture? The two key points here, 75% of the total is accounted for by chronic diseases. Only 2% of all health care spending is on prevention. And we want to go beyond just prevention. I'm going to be talking about lifestyle medicine, which is a key, I think, for the future of medicine in our country. Now, when we look at the nature of disease, it can be viewed from a variety of dimensions. 
And let us consider the disease severity. Here we have zero, as you can see on the left there. That's optimal health. Then we have maximum, and you have severity goes up. Maximum severity, of course, leading to death. We can look at disease severity over our long, our lifetime. The ideal would be, of course, to have perfect health and function until we die. That doesn't always happen. That's not always realistic. But, it, but in many cases, people can have really almost perfect health most of their life. And the picture kind of looks like this. We can look at disease severity over our lifetime. Here we're born. We have good health. As time goes on, we have different clinical symptoms uh, that initiate different types of medical care till death. Now, the ideal would be something like this, where we have perfect health and function until we die right at the end. I mean, if you had, this is what we would, would be really the ideal, if we could have really good health, and then at the end of our lives, something, you know, die very quickly and very suddenly, not dragged out and like uh, we see in most cases because life is quite unideal. And what happens is we get various illnesses until one causes the death. And we have different types of illnesses throughout that lifetime. Some never enjoy good health. Of course, with birth defects and other problems, they have illnesses all their lives until they die. Well, a number of years ago, a very profound statement was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, which says, in the coming decades, the most important determinants of health and longevity will be the personal choices made by each individual. And Dr. Dennis Burkett, who is a wonderful man, he's the one that really showed the importance of eating a high-fiber diet, and he's also the discoverer of Burkett's lymphoma, he said, the concept that Western diseases are lifestyle-related and therefore potentially preventable and reversible is the most important medical discovery of the 20th century. And now we're into the 21st century, and I feel that it goes for that today, too. There is a new form of medicine being established in the United States called lifestyle medicine. It's nothing really new. It's been around for a long time. But a group of physicians now are coming together to develop a specialty in the field of lifestyle medicine. In other words, treating diseases and illnesses with lifestyle. And Dr. James Rippey really pioneered a lot of this work, and he put out, and this is a picture, actual picture, of the first medical textbook in lifestyle medicine that came out in 1999. And we have also established an organization called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And this is a new specialty that started in 1994. They, these doctors hope that they can get it to where they can have board certification specialties in the field of lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine is what we call evidence-based health care in the 21st century. And it integrates prevention as well as using lifestyle to treat. Now, as a nutritionist, my favorite area is in the area of medical nutrition therapy. The father of modern medicine said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. He used lifestyle medicine. He used medical nutrition therapy in treating disease. So really, before there was medicine, what did we have? We had food. Before there was medicine, food was used as a treatment for many diseases. What is the best type of diet? You're going to hear about it a little bit next month, I know, from Dr. Harris. But the optimal diet really is a plant-based diet. And fruits and vegetables and plant foods are the most powerful tools in medicine for the prevention, treatment, and even reversal of diseases. Dead foods, the refined, the processed, the food, I call them foodless foods, they lead to illness, disease, sickness, and eventually death. And the diseases that we have today, unlike other countries, are really diseases of affluence. And these are the rich eating types of diseases. If you eat a diet of rich foods, which most Americans eat on a daily basis, it leads to atherosclerosis and heart attack, hypertension, diabetes. You can look on the whole list. These are all the types of diseases that are so prevalent in our country. And there's a direct relationship to the foods that we eat every day. This is what I call the standard American diet, SAD for short, S-A-D, SAD promotes lifestyle-related disease and premature aging. Here again, foods from plants prevent the diseases that are killing us. Let's look at nuts. A lot of research has come up recently in, 
in nut consumption. We know that frequent consumption of nuts actually protects against heart attacks. People who ate nuts frequently five times uh, a week, at least five times a week or more, had a 51% reduction in heart attacks and a 48% re reduction in death from heart attacks compared to those who seldom ate nuts. Eat nuts and seeds daily, at least five servings per week. Now, they are high in fat, but they have the healthy types of fats. Almonds, walnuts. Walnuts, of course, are high in the omega-3s. Cashews, Brazil nuts, which are high in selenium. Hazelnuts, pecans. And then the different types of seeds, particularly flax seeds, are high in omega-3 fatty acids. Almonds, instead of using butter, use nut butter, almond butter, or peanut butter. Whole wheat bread and heart disease, relative risk of heart attack. Here on the left, you see the relative risk, just white bread. Then you have a mixed uh, diet with, with a blend of whole wheat and, and refined bread. And you see that heart disease uh, risk factors are reduced by going towards the whole wheat bread. Remember the saying, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead? Well, now, now we have scientific proof to show that that's really true. Choose a wide variety of grains. Just don't focus on wheat, but try oat bread and try uh, rye and many of the different types of grains out there. Oatmeal breads, whole rye, high fiber cereals, brown rice instead of white rice. I wish we can still, you know, we're still trying to get people in Hawaii to eat brown rice instead of that white rice, all that refined rice. And you know, the deficiency diseases in the B vitamins back in Asia were first discovered when people were eating white rice instead of brown rice. Fruit and vegetable consumption, this study is women pr probability of dying in middle life ages 35 to 69. And you can see at the high intake, it's much lower. And if you have, have, have higher or lower in rates of uh, fruit consumption, you have higher risk of premature death. Same thing with men, almost the same pattern. Here again, research showing eating more fruits and vegetables can help us live longer, healthier lives. Fruit and vegetable intake and risk of stroke. 20-year follow-up of 832 men. For each increment of three servings of fruits and vegetables per day, there was a 45% decrease in the risk of stroke. Why is that? There's some wonderful phytochemicals that are in fruits and vegetables that could actually prevent stroke. There's more and more research being done on the power of fruits and vegetables for preventing various types of stroke. Now, what are the protective elements in fruits and vegetables that may help with this? Potassium protects against high blood pressure. Folate or folic acid helps prevent high blood uh, homocysteine levels, which can lead to heart disease and stroke. Fiber helps to lower blood pressure, cholesterol, particularly your soluble fiber helps to bind up that cholesterol, gets it like a sponge and helps get rid of it through the digestive tract, and also helps to keep the blood sugar levels normal. And the antioxidants have powerful anti-cancer properties. And these antioxidants also can help protect against Alzheimer's disease. More and more research is showing this. And of course, vitamin C, Linus Pauling always promoted vitamin C as a powerful antioxidant, and fruits and vegetables are where you're going to get that vitamin C. There are many ways to get more fruits and vegetables in the diet. These are just some suggestions. But the idea is just eat them. You know, Nike says just do it. Just eat them. Just get them in your diet as much as you possibly can. Why are foods from plants preventing the diseases that kill, kill us? There's a number of reasons. First, they're low in fat, and they have the right types of fat. They're high in fiber. They're low in calories. When you fill up on plant foods, that causes you to avoid the harmful foods. And they're full of antioxidants and many other wonderful protective uh, phytonutrients. Here we have some of those what I call dead foods, <laughs> the foods that really do not promote health at all. They promote illness, sickness, disease. They're loaded with saturated fat. They're loaded with cholesterol. And this is what we need to get away from as far as heart disease and many other health problems. Saturated fat raises blood cholesterol, increasing your risk of heart disease. Luckily, you see that shortening there. That's trans fat. That's the worst you could eat. And uh, now they're labeling that. Many companies are shifting away from the trans fats. Now, a number of years ago, the two gentlemen that received the Nobel Prize for their research in cholesterol metabolism, particularly LDL cholesterol metabolism, I remember this back in the 80s when they received this award, 
because the research was so profound and it really showed how cholesterol was metabolized and so forth and how it functioned in the body and how they did research to help to develop medicines to lower blood cholesterol. But in their findings, they made a very uh, profound statement. They said that humans are not designed to eat animal fat and cholesterol. Based on all their research, they said our body just cannot handle eating the cholesterol and saturated fat. And based on the research, they said that if you, people were to have a heart-healthy diet, they would have to eat so low levels of these uh, th items that most people would not do it. They'd have to go all vegetarian. They even admitted that. However, they had the wrong conclusion, I think, and they, their conclusion was, well, one day we're going to develop drugs and medicines that allow you to eat all the steak you want, and that'll, and I actually wrote a letter in protest to what they said, Scientific American magazine never got published. I thought that was the wrong uh, situation. They also said if Americans were to eat the way to really prevent all these heart attacks and not eat the animal fats and cholesterol, they said another problem would be that it would cause severe economic problems on our economy. So brilliant scientists with non-brilliant conclusions, I thought. Fruits and plant foods, uh, vegetables, nuts, they have zero cholesterol. There is no cholesterol in plant foods. Here we have cross-section of an artery, and as you can see, as we build up the cholesterol plaque and the lumen and artery, we increase our risk of heart disease. Many of you are aware of this, to the point where it almost blocks it up totally. And when you're on the typical SAD diet, with all those fats floating around your bloodstream, those blood cells clump together to form blood clots, forming a heart attack. Now, the good news is that we can reverse this process. We know it can be reversed. And by the way, anyone have an idea what age we start seeing this process to begin? What would you say? It's late teens, most people think. But actually, starting at age three, we start seeing the beginnings of streaks along the arteries. Now, do you think it's because a three-year-old's smoking much? <laughs> do you think they, they're, they're under a lot of, too much stress? They give a lot of stress, but no, there's not too much stress. Why do you think? McDonald's, dairy products, all those high-fat and cholesterol foods that these kids are eating. Well, Dean Ornish, uh, a number of years ago in San Francisco, showed that you can reverse atherosclerosis in his studies was published in the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine showed that heart disease is reversible. Putting patients on a very low-fat vegetarian diet combined with some exercise and relaxation, stress management, a whole lifestyle approach that 80, over 80% 80 of the patients actually had reversal of atherosclerosis. Their arteries were actually clearer than they were before a year before. And when they did it after five years, they actually had more improvement. Now, this is the interesting point. He also put another group of patients on the American Heart Association diet to see what happens with them, the, tip, the type of diet that most doctors recommend to their patients, right? He showed in his studies that those patients got worse or didn't improve at all. So the conclusion was to get big results, you need to make big changes in the lifestyle if it comes to reversal of atherosclerosis. Here we have his uh, illustrations. This is what we call a PET scan. On the left was when the patient started a year ago. And this is kind of an average PET scan of all the different patients that were in the study. And the right is one year later, just one year later. That red color and more yellow color indicates more circulation to the heart in other words, the vessels are opening up, more blood circulation to the heart as a result of the reversal of um, the atherosclerosis. Cow potatoes. It's not a vegetable, it's a type of person. <laughs> Prediabetes, metabolic syndrome, syndrome X. Have you heard of that? That's the thing everyone's talking about. And it's related to high levels of abdominal fat in combination of all these things, high blood pressure, low blood levels of uh, L HDL, the good type of cholesterol, insulin resistance, and hypertension. We know today, just like heart disease, you can reverse heart disease on a vegetarian diet, that vegan diets have been proven to actually reverse type 2 diabetes. The Weimar Institute uh, in Northern California has done a lot of work with uh, diabetic patients, putting them on vegan diets and seeing reversal. Within days, they start seeing significant improvements. Same thing with Dr. Neil Barnard with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's done research, and the same thing with vegan diets. Vegan diets are a powerful medicine for reversing diabetes. Causes of cancer. You see here, 35% 
related to diet, and many scientists think it's actually even more. In fact, poor diet and use of tobacco may cause as much as 65% of all cancers. So let's talk about some of the cancer prevention guidelines. The first one is choose most of the foods you eat from plant foods. Obvious. Those phytochemicals in the, in the fruits and vegetables. Uh, eating fruits and vegetables lowers cancer risk. And you can see the number of studies, the type of cancer, and the numbers showing reduced risk by eating an increased uh, fruit and vegetable diet. Here in Hawaii, we have a great program called Eat a Rainbow. Are you familiar with that? In other words, eat the Hawaiian rainbow color of fruits and vegetables every day. Try to get all those colors in your diet because you're protecting yourself against a lot of diseases. And here we have the color wheel of food. The white and greens and the reds and the purples and the oranges and yellow and oranges and greens. This is the food color wheel that was developed at UCLA. And all these colors provide antioxidants, they have that help with DNA protection, prevention of blindness, heart disease, cancer, dementia, and premature age, aging. So eat that rainbow of food. Try to get all the colors you can. Now white is a color, but you want the whites from garlic and from cauliflower. You don't want it from the whiter the bread, the sooner the dead, white rice and all that, and all those refined foods. Recommended number of servings by the USDA, Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion, showing how many fruits and vegetables it's recommended. And really, the ideal is to try to get nine servings of fruits and vegetables in the diet a day is optimal. For cancer prevention, you need nine. Five is minimal for just general health, but nine for cancer prevention, particularly for prostate cancer prevention for men. Now, what's a serving? This is probably the biggest confusion people don't know. A medium-sized fruit, three-quarters cup of 100% fruit or fruit vegetable juice, a half a cup fresh serving of frozen or canned. Uh, I don't really recommend canned. Ideally, fresh or frozen would be the best. One cup of raw uh, leafy uh, vegetables, half a cup of peas, or a quarter cup of dried fruits. Do you know one in 11 Americans eats the amount, of, eats at least five fruits or vegetables a day? Just one in 11. Only 18% of Americans eat vegetables from the cabbage family. Only 20% eat fruits and vegetables that are rich in carotenoids. Only 59% eat fruit on a regular basis. Only 28% eat fruits and vegetables that are rich in vitamin C on a regular basis. So they're missing out on all those wonderful phytochemicals and antioxidants. And of course, these are powerful tools, and these are some of the different antioxidants. Of course, vitamin C and E, and then the carotenoids, the pigments, have these antioxidants in them, like alpha and beta carotene, lycopene that you find in tomatoes, uh, lutein, which you find in, in different compounds, in different fruits and vegetables. And then the flavonoids, the anthocyanidins, which have the red, purple, and blue, and the anthoxanthins, which are the white colored fruits and vegetables. Free radicals. Unstable compounds promote cancer, heart disease, premature aging, and cataracts. And of course, all these things, fried foods, tobacco, alcohol, also promote the production of these unstable compounds that can lead to cancer. Now, what about taking supplements as far as you're getting your antioxidants? I, I'm a believer in eating the healthiest diet you can, and I believe in sensible supplementation. But supplementation doesn't replace eating those fruits and vegetables because there are many compounds that we find in these things that probably man will never know about and we can't put them all in supplements so make sure you get a lot of fruits and vegetables in the diet and there's at least 10,000 phytochemicals that we have identified so far now when it comes to cancer fruits and vegetables play a major role in every step of the, to block the cancer process from a normal cell going to a precancer cell, from precancer cell to cancer cell to cancer cell to invasive cancer cells. The compounds in these plant foods help inhibit and block these things from happening. This is from the Adventist Health Study where they compared California men and Adventist men and then they compared Adventist men who were on vegan diets and they found significant reduction in the risk of prostate cancer of Seventh-day Adventist men that do not eat dairy products. Here we have a sample of an anti-cancer menu and you can see a lot of wonderful plant foods from breakfast, lunch, and dinner and it's important to incorporate these things throughout the day so that they can have the powerful effects in your health. Fruits and vegetables, this is a whole list of different ones that are high in, in, in vitamin C. Second uh, cancer prevention guideline is to limit the intake of high-fat foods, particularly from animal sources. Carcinogens are produced in cooking, like this charcoal broil steak 
It's a two-pound charcoal broil steak. has a uh, production, produces a carcinogen called benzopyrene, which is one of the most deadly carcinogens known to man. And the amount of carcinogen or benzopyrene in this two-pound steak is equivalent to what you'd find in 33 packs of cigarettes. Of course, you're eating it. You're not smoking it. But when they feed benzopyrene to rats, they develop tumors. Now let's talk about anti-aging. And how does this fit into beautiful skin and not getting those wrinkles and, and living longer, healthier lives? And it is possible to live to be over 100 years of age. I just saw a lady the other day. Her, uh, she's 100 and her husband is 103. Is that right, Mag? He was 103? Yep. So it's, it's amazing uh, how healthy people can be. You know, longevity, back in 1796, the average lifespan was only 25. In 1896, it was 48. And in 2006 and 8 and beyond, uh, you know, right now, uh, most people, about 80 years we're seeing, but, and anti-aging scientists are actually predicting average life expectancies of 120 by 2046. The goal, of course, is not just to have a long life, but to have quality life. The goal is to keep a good quality as well as quantity of life. And the goal is to die as late in life as possible, right? One of my good friends, Dr. Howard Murad, always says, aging is a fact of life, but looking your age is not. And what are the things to do for a long, healthy life, according to the American College of Lifestyle or Anti-Aging Medicine, is eat a wide variety of plant foods, maintain a healthy weight, choose a diet low in fat and cholesterol, choose a diet with plenty of fruits and vegetables, and be moderate in the sugar, salt, and, and so forth. We know today that by eating less, you can live longer, cutting down on the calories. 50% increase in longevity in, in animal studies with 30 to 60% decrease in calorie intake. How many of you saw the National Geographic a few years ago where they looked at the different cultures of longevity? The Okinawans, the Sardinians, and the Seventh-day Adventist population in Loma Linda. You know, in Okinawa, they, they have quite a bit of life expectancy compared to the United States. They have more centarians in their country compared to the United States. Here are some of the active seniors in Okinawa that are very active in their exercise. And these gentlemen are over 100 years of age. He's a 103-year-old individual. And when they looked at the people that live to be over 100 years of age, what did they see in Okinawa? They eat a low-calorie diet. It's a plant-based diet, unrefined carbohydrates, low in protein, low in sodium. 9 to 17 servings of vegetables daily. 7 to 13 servings of whole grains daily two to four servings of calcium-rich foods, and a lot of that is in the form of seaweed. Two to four servings of flavonoid-rich foods, such as green tea or soybean-based products, and two to four servings a day of fruit. They eat very little protein. In fact, it only makes up about 10% of their diet in the calories. And very little sodium, uh, little or no alcohol, and they use healthy types of oils and fats. Here we have a typical 280-calorie meal in America and a 280-calorie diet in Okinawa. And you can see they get much more bulk, more, you know, more quantity of food in the Okinawan diet compared to the hamburger. And that's one of the reasons Americans eat too much, because they're, they're always hungry. They get all these calories, just small pieces of food, and they don't get satisfied. Another area is in the area of Hunza, up in the Himalayas. My friend, Dr. J.M. Hoffman, studied these people a number of years ago. The oldest recorded age is 130 years of age, a very uh, pristine mountainous region. These gentlemen are all over 106 years of age. The, one, the second one to the left is 106 years old, and he walks 12 miles every day. And when you're in Hunza, you're walking up a lot of hills. Here's a beautiful, pristine, they're very physically active. Apricots is one of the foods they eat every day in their diet, rich in antioxidants. They dry it and they have it fresh. And they do everything organically with their beautiful terraced ways of growing. Whole grain, bread, the chapati is used in their diet every day. When you look at their diet, a lot of whole grains, 80% of the vegetables that they eat is raw with the skins. 20% are lightly steamed. So most of the diet is raw. Apricot seed oil is used is their fat and very sparingly because it's, uh, it, it, it turns rancid easily. Grains, buckwheat, millet, rice, corn, fruits, apricots, mulberries, grapes. You can see a very healthy diet. And animal products account for only 1% of their total calories. They do have a little milk, butter, and cheese, very sparingly. Uh, small amounts of meat averaging 3 ounces per month, which is 
nothing. <laughs> Actually, they eat meat about 13 days a year, and the rest of the time they follow a vegetarian diet because they don't have refrigeration. And in the United States, we have the Seventh-day Adventist population. And uh, Seventh-day Adventists are a great uh, group to study because they don't smoke, they don't drink. 50% of Seventh-day Adventists follow a vegetarian diet. And studies show that vegetarian Seventh-day Adventists live almost a decade longer in life compared to the average American. This was a good friend of mine, Hulda Crooks, who lived to be 102 years old. She was a Seventh-day Adventist and climbed Mount Whitney every year in her 60s and 80s. And at 92, she was the oldest woman to climb to the top of Mount Fuji. And she attributed a lot of that not only to her good exercise routine, but her vegetarian diet. Jack LaLanne was raised a Seventh-day Adventist. And he says, exercise is king, nutrition is queen, and if you put them together, you have a kingdom. He also says, and in fact, uh, Patricia Bragg and I had the opportunity to go to Jack LaLanne's house just about a few months ago, before his 94th birthday, and uh, we had a nice lunch with him. He's, a, he's still keeping fit, still exercising regularly. And you know what he says? Dying is easy. Living takes a lot of work. You know, dying, all you have to do is sit around, don't exercise, watch TV, eat types of junk food. That's easy. But living takes a lot of work. And he says that exercise, he says, is a pain in the butt. It's hard work to do, you know. Uh, but that's what it takes. Now, when we define aging, a lot of people think of wrinkles, sun damage, less hair, poor memory, poor digestion, reduced circulation. And aging begins at the cellular level. That's where it all begins. All cells have a membrane that protect the walls. And if they're compromised, uh, then we start to age. And there's one scientific truth that we see is that regardless of what causes disease or aging, the final common pathway is that there is a reduction in water in tissue. And there are many different theories of age, and I'd like to talk to you about one of them that was developed by a doctor I worked with, Dr. Howard Murad, called the Cellular Water Principle. And water is found in the body in basically three areas, in the intracellular level, within connective tissue, and then there's wasted water, like edema. And, that's, uh, and the goal is to increase intracellular water and, and connective tissue water and reduce that wasted water. Think of a grape. You know how nice a grape is? It's very moist. It's got all moisture in it. And you look at a healthy cell membrane and think of that as a grape. It's got a great membrane. But what happens as we are bombarded by oxidants, free radicals, it damages and puts holes in that cellular wall and the water is actually lost. Also, inflammation takes place and we get damaged that cellular wall. Inflammation is from eating pro-inflammatory foods like the meats and the cheeses and the dairy products and all those things. And we lose that moisture. The thing is, is to make sure that we promote our cellular health by eating foods, build it up with things that are rich in lecithin, healthy fats, the right types of protein, so that we can keep that cellular wall strong and keep the moisture in. So the uh, cellular water principle is a key uh, uh, theory in anti-aging. And, and one of the key things in this theory is that we need to eat more raw fruits and vegetables. So. A vegan diet, I believe, is really the ultimate type of diet for anti-aging, and particularly eating more raw fruits and vegetables and cooking things less. Now, let's go over some of the key power foods for anti-aging, health, longevity, and disease prevention. The first one is acai berries. How many have heard of acai? It's really popular. Acai is a, comes from a palm tree in the Amazon River in Brazil. These uh, are wild berries, and they have a, actually a slight hint. Some people think it has a little chocolate-type flavor to it. And uh, most of the calories are actually coming from fat in these berries, by the way. And they make nine uh, types of fats that are fats that promote, that are actually anti-inflammatory. So that's one of the benefits of acai. They're rich in anthocyanidins. And by the way, they have 10 times more anthocyanidin compounds than red wine. So they are very high in what we call the OREC scale. That's uh, very, one of the highest antioxidant uh, fruits that we know. They have anti-cancer properties, anti-aging properties, and according to Dr. Nicol, uh, Nicholas Paracone, who's a skin care specialist, does a lot of work with patients in having more beautiful skin and preventing the oxidation and, and damage to the skin. The next anti-aging food and health food is almonds. Almonds, of course, are a great source of plant protein. They're excellent in fiber. They are a really rich source of natural vitamin E. They contain antioxidants such as flavonoids, quercetin. They have antioxidants that prevent cancer cell growth and oxidation of LDL cholesterol. They help in the reduction of inflammation. 
And the way we measure that is that when people are put on diets high in almonds, we check their C-reactive protein, and, and the numbers are within more ideal levels. Uh, they are mostly monounsaturated fats, so it's the healthy monounsaturated fats. Apples, you know, they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, there's a lot of truth to that because apples are very rich in antioxidants, particularly in the skin, of course, the color. Vitamin C, high in um, soluble fiber. Soluble fiber helps you to lower cholesterol. Apple fiber is one of the best types of fiber for reducing cholesterol, and that's in the form of what we call pectin. It's rich in phenolic compounds, antioxidants, and flavonoids, including uh, some of the ones that are shown in the research studies to be very potent anti-cancer and anti-heart disease flavonoid compounds. The other, and by the way, I want to mention something about apple cider vinegar, because there is new research showing that by having apple cider vinegar in, mixed in maybe some water prior to a meal, that that can actually reduce the glycemic index of that meal. In other words, it can help reduce your blood glucose levels, and it has some benefit for diabetics. So whether you have it mixed with water prior to a meal or you have it on a salad, put in the apple cider vinegar in the salad dressing on, on the salad, getting it prior to a meal seems to be very promising for diabetics. Apricots, of course, are the staple food of Hunza, rich in antioxidants, particularly beta carotene. In fact, there's 16,000 micrograms in just three apricots of beta carotene, very rich source, and good source of potassium, vitamin C, fiber, and other phytochemicals, and phytochemicals that are now being established that are important for eye health, anti-cancer, and heart disease prevention properties. Blackberries are one of the richest antioxidant berries out there today. In fact, they're higher in antioxidants than blueberries, blackberries. A lot of people don't realize that. Rich source of vitamin C and fiber, tannins, flavonoids, and anti-cancer compounds that have been studied in recent years. So get those blackberries. Blueberries, of course, is one that is one of the highest on the ORAC scale. ORAC stands for Oxygen Radical Absorb Absorbency uh, Capacity, and that's a standard that's used to see the antioxidant levels in various foods. They're high in anthocyanidins, and that makes, these are the compounds that make blueberries blue. And that's the pigment. Elagic acid, they have anti-tumor properties, antibacterial properties, particularly for people with urinary tract infections, find them helpful if they eat a lot of blueberries. They have anti-stroke uh, properties, and particularly those are induced, uh, anti-stroke induced brain damage. Uh, and Alzheimer's, as I attend the uh, American Dietetic Association means more and more, we're finding that blueberries are being thought of as very promising for uh, treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Broccoli, and by the way, sorry, I bro spelled broccoli wrong here. <laughs> but it is rich in vitamin C, beta carotene, and it's one of the most highly absorbed forms of calcium. When you're eating broccoli, more absorbed, better absorption than uh, dairy products. Rich in chromium, indols, isothiocyanates, which are anti-cancer uh, compounds. Sulforaphane is what's very well known for blocking the, you know, blocking the progression and development of cancerous tumors. But if you get bro broccoli sprouts, you've heard of broccoli sprouts? That's higher in sulforaphane than just eating broccoli, so look for those. And we know that sulforaphane also prevents the growth of H. pylori bacteria, which causes ulcers. Now, broccoli contains those compounds which stimulate enzymes that break down cancer-causing chemicals. So that's my favorite vegetable, by the way, broccoli. Now, what about cabbage? Not everyone likes cabbage, but I encourage you to get more cabbage in your diet and get the different colors and varieties of cabbage. Cabbage is high in vitamin C, fiber, vitamin K, folate, potassium. Red cabbage is high in those anthocyanins, which is compounds that you find in wine, for instance, and in the red grapes. It has anti-cancer properties because it's a member of the crucifer uh, family. It's rich in glucocyanolates, which are these anti-cancer compounds, and rich in indol 3 carbonyl and some of these exotic anti-cancer compounds that scientists are studying today. We know that many of these compounds actually activate and stabilize the body's antioxidant and detoxification methods. 
methods. Cauliflower, uh, by the way, is, has some lecithin in it, which is good for building those healthy uh, cells, but contains some other compounds uh, similar to broccoli that also have anti-cancer properties. Simon has some wonderful properties that may help as an anti-inflammatory, but also can help in type 2 diabetes by lowering blood sugar levels. And uh, more research is showing the importance of cinnamon in diabetic diets. One of the things that's interesting that uh, some more research has come out that cinnamon actually reduces uric acid induced arthritis. And this is because it inhibits the enzyme that's responsible for producing uric acid. Want to eat more citrus foods because of the bioflavonoids. Flaxseed. You know, flaxseed is rich in those omega-3 fatty acids. You don't have to get it from fish. You can get it in flaxseed products, and ground flaxseed is the best way to get it instead of the flaxseed oil. It contains lignans. These are plant compounds that act like weak estrogens. So for women, that's very important. In heart health, it, it helps to lower LDL cholesterol, reduce inflammation associated with heart disease risk. So it's a wonderful food to include in your diet. Now, garlic is one that I spent two years studying. And garlic, of course, has been a home remedy for many years, but it does, studies show that it does lower LDL cholesterol, to, uh, and total cholesterol reduces it by about 10% in, when you look at all the studies that have been done. There have been 30 studies to show the anti-cancer properties in garlic. And, of course, garlic has real strong antibacterial properties as well. Ginger... Well, you know, the doctor used to give what when someone had upset stomachs? Ginger ale. Why? Because it does have compounds and has uh, positive effects in helping having anti-nausea properties. And particularly for women with morning sickness, it can be very helpful by including ginger in the diet on a regular basis. It is rich in several different antioxidants that may uh, prevent uh, different types of cancer and has many an natural anti-inflammatory compounds in it. Goji berries. Everyone is into goji berries today. Of course, those berries grow in Tibet and in China and even in the Hunza region. And... Uh, Goji berries are very high on the ORAC scale, one of the richest antioxidant fruits known to man. And some studies have shown that it can help reduce blood sugar and total cholesterol levels. This is an interesting uh, study that recently came out. Extracts of goji actually, actually help stop the spread and encourage the death of liver cancer cells. So some studies are now going on in the area with goji. Now, grapes, of course, are in wine. They have a lot of those great proanthocyanidins, and they also have what's called resveratrol. Resveratrol is big in the news right now. It's a key uh, phytochemical constituent found in the skins, particularly of the purple grapes, that have anti-inflammatory properties and anti-carcinogenic compounds. So it is re regarded much more and more as the heart healthy ingredient is veritrol as far as phytochemicals. And it's really the resveratrol that's doing the heart health prevention, heart disease prevention as compared to the alcohol. You don't have to drink wine. You can get it from grape juice. And drinking grape juice is very good. Caveous foods to eat on the face of the planet. Rich in beta carotene, rich in lutein, which is good for eye health. And it has anti-cancer properties and, by the way, is an outstanding source of calcium, vegetarian source of calcium. Now, kiwi, there, there's interesting compounds that they found in kiwi that, helps, that show that it helps to prevent blood cells from clotting and uh, forming blood clots. Mango, one of Hawaii's favorite. And I love the Hawaiian mangoes. Rich in beta carotene, vitamin C, potassium. And the yellow and orange colors have pigments have anti-cancer properties and strong flavonoid uh, sources. Mushrooms. Now, mushrooms are not, you know, people say, oh, mushrooms are very nutritious. They're not really that nutritious. There's not a lot of nutrients in them. But they are a, a good source of selenium, which is an anti-cancer nutrient. They have anti-cancer polyphenol compounds, and we know that they have immune system enhancement properties, particularly from what's called beta 
glucans, which help stimulate the immune system cells to get rid of uh, abnormal cells that cause disease. So getting more mushrooms and eat all the different types of variety of mushrooms. By the way, white button mushrooms have, are a source of vitamin D, and that's an important nutrient that a lot of vegetarians don't get enough of in their diet. Oats, of course, are high in soluble fiber for lowering cholesterol. Papaya, rich in vitamin C, beta carotene, and other compounds that have anti-cancer properties. Uh, pomegranate, one of the richest sources of antioxidants. In fact, uh, by the way, eating pomegranates and drinking pomegranate juice produces sun protection factors that help you so you don't sunburn as well, as bad, I should say, and protects you against this, the aging effects of sun. It has anti-inflammatory properties, and by the way, new research shows that it can inhibit prostate cancer tumor growth. Soybeans, a lot of controversy over soybeans. I believe soybeans are very healthy to eat, but you have to eat them, you know, in sensible amounts. They do have uh, factors in there, of course, that can help in protection of uh, a number of different types of forms of cancer. And we know, too, that soybean, uh, the protein in soy, can be beneficial in lowering cholesterol. Turmeric, that herb that's in curry, strong anti-cancer uh, properties. Curcumin is the uh, compound that we find in turmeric, and uh, it's easy to incorporate into the diet and has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. And of course, walnut, they're saying, is going to be the new fish oil because it's rich in what? Omega-3 fatty acids. And by the way, all you need is maybe five walnuts a day to get those important uh, essential fatty acids. It's also a great source of gamma tocopherol, which is a, a type of vitamin E that's very rich in antioxidants. Well, in closing, I just want to emphasize, again, there are, I could talk about a hundred different fruits and vegetables that are important. These are just giving some of them. But here again, remember, foods from plants prevent the diseases that are killing us. We need to eat more of them. Foods from plants promote health, longevity, beauty, and vitality. And all we have to do is eat more of them. Unfortunately, vegetarians, many vegetarians, don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, and yet they're vegetarians. So incorporate, try to strive for that nine fruits and vegetables every day, and it will add a lot of health to your long life. Thank you. Any questions? questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much as always. That was so enlightening. Uh, we have a time for about five or eight minutes of questions. Okay. Okay, in the back. Vegetables cooked or uncooked, what is the difference? Is that the question? Saying, particularly from the cellular aging standpoint, eating more raw fruits and vegetables is good because the water in there is more conducive to helping improve the uh, intracellular water in the body. But uh, one of the things that is lost, of course, when you do do a lot of cooking of fruits and vegetables is the vitamin C. That's the first one that's, that's lost. Did I answer your question? Okay. Canned fish. Well, I'm not big on fish, period. <laughs> And I'll have to tell you, just a few days ago, I've become very close friends in Santa Barbara with Jean-Michel Cousteau. And if you saw his last special, they tested his blood and some of his colleagues' blood, and they saw all these um, bad environmental chemicals that were in their bloodstream. And I feel, uh, yes, you know, fish, you know, it's better than chicken or beef probably, but by the way, it still had the same amount of cholesterol. Uh, so I don't think f eating fish is the, the ultimate thing to do. I think I'd rather see you get the uh, healthy fats from your flaxseed oil, your walnuts, and I'm very concerned about fish and the contaminants in the oceans today. Okay, can I speak to the idea of that we need supplements because our soils have been over farmed and all that and so forth? Now, I, I believe in an optimal diet is a plant-based diet, a, a vegan diet, and you try to eat the best you can. 
I do I am concerned about the depletion of our soils and the over farming and so forth and loss of minerals so I, um, I kind of approach nutrition in eating the optimal diet that you possibly can which I believe is a, a vegan diet I think there's good evidence to show that show that and I believe in taking sensible supplements along with that. I think taking a good broad spectrum vegetarian formulated multivitamin and mineral is a wise thing to do for overall prevention. It doesn't have to be that expensive and then you're kind of covering all your bases. Some people may want to take additional things like whether you want to take flax, omega-3 from plant sources or vitamin C. Depends on your individual um, health condition. So the question is, I understand you uh, can drink water, but it's not as good as you have watermelon. Is that right? That's what I'm saying. I think the water you eat is more important than the water you drink. I'm not saying don't drink water, and I think drinking distilled water or purified water is, is very good. But, it, you know, if you drink a lot of water, what's happened? You're running to the bathroom all the time, right? But when you eat a lot of plant foods that are water rich, and I think this is another aspect, you know, people don't think about it, eating a water rich diet for optimal health, that you don't see the same thing. You're not running to the bathroom all the time. What are some of the best things I've seen in people that have changed from an animal diet to a. Well, I think the thing that I see that helps, that move people to change their diet is when they see people's improvement in health. I'm in the health field. So when they see someone lose 100 pounds on a vegan diet or they see someone reverse heart disease, as Dean Ornish showed, or reverse their diabetes, that gets people really say, well, I want to know about that. And that's very motivational for people making changes. If you're, and the ones that look better and younger and more vital, uh, that's the best witness for a healthy uh, vegetarian diet. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I uh, wish you all uh, aloha. And I will be over here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.